I've entitled my message, Five Truths About the Resurrection. And our text is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. But before we hear from God's word, let's pray and ask his help in understanding it. Father, this is your word, and we ask that those who believe on Jesus Christ hear it today in their ears proclaimed that they might be built up in the grace which is in Christ Jesus, and that those who do not know Jesus savingly, those who do not trust in him as he's offered in the gospel for their salvation, might turn in faith and believe. And as we all hear the word, Lord, let us be reminded that you are the one who opens hearts for us to hear, to receive, and to respond. And we ask this in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, we read, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May we hear, believe, and obey its truths in faith. You know, resurrection is not a denominational issue or, or a point of theological debate. Either we believe that Christ is raised from the dead or we do not. And many Christians think that the resurrection of Jesus on that first Easter Sunday was an event that literally has no meaning for our Christian life today. In other words, that Jesus was raised from the dead makes no difference how I live my life today. Well, that's absolutely untrue. In fact, this is exactly the thing that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ were not private events, but the public work of our covenant mediator who died and rose again as our representative. And as we hear this morning, the empty tomb has everything to do with how we live our lives today as disciples of Jesus. You know, the good news is this, that we can enjoy new life in Christ because we are united to him in his death and resurrection. Our bondage to sin and our love for sin, as Paul will tell us, died with Jesus. Now, united uh, in faith, united by faith to him in this new resurrection life, we have freedom from sin's dominion and mastery over us. There is a very crucial question you have to ask yourself this morning. Do you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus? Do you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus? Well, we mentioned our points and uh, 
the points that we have are five. Five points that we will look at. Five truths about the resurrection. Number one, Christ was resurrected by the glory of the Father. We see that in verse four. Number two, Christ being resurrected will never die again. We see that in verse nine. Having died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Verse eight. Fourth, united in death with Christ, we certainly will be united in his resurrection. Verse five. And the fifth point, the fifth truth that we see about the resurrection is Christ lives so that we might die to sin and walk in newness of life. And we see this in various verses, one to three, a part of verse four, verses six to seven, and verse 11. And a great deal of our time will be spent on this fifth truth, this fifth point. Truth point number one, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We see this in verse four. Christ was raised, Romans 6, 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Could there be any more clear, wonderful, beautiful, hopeful, simple statement for Easter morning? Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. This truth is the basis of all the other truths that flow in our text today. It was God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead, and by the act, by that act, God declared that Christ's atoning sacrifice had been accepted. The penalty for our sins was paid in full. The resurrection was God's declaration that he had canceled the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demands. If Christ were still in the tomb, it would mean that God's wrath was not satisfied and we would still stand guilty before God. But the glorious Easter message is he is not in the tomb. He has risen, as he said. That's truth point number one. Truth point number two, Christ being resurrected will never die again. We see this in verse nine. Verse nine says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Here Paul is emphasizing that as a result of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus cannot die again. Think about the difference between Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection of Lazarus. Unlike Lazarus' resurrection, which did not spare him from another physical death, Christ's resurrection meant a decisive and final break with death and all its power. To make sure we get that point that Jesus cannot die again, Paul restates for emphasis, death no longer has dominion or mastery over him. But what difference does this make for us, Jesus' followers? When you follow the Apostle Paul's argument in Romans 6, you find that our union with Christ, that our spiritual connection to him, makes what happened to him true for us as well. That's truth point number two. Truth point number three. Having died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. That's verse eight. Verse 8 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe, we believe that we will also live with him. That's tied right in to the next truth point. Truth point 4. United in death with Christ, we certainly will be united in resurrection. Having died with Christ, we believe we will live with him, restated in the next verse, which is our verse five, that is the truth point number four in verse five. For if, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Having died with Christ, we will live with him. United with Christ in death, we certainly believe in the uniting 
of us with him in resurrection. But how? But how are we united to Christ? Well, this union or connection to Christ comes through faith. That union with Christ means that by faith we are united to the resurrected Son of God so that what is true of him is true of us. There are two words that summarize our union with Christ, representation and participation. Representation and participation. Representation and participation means that Jesus represents us. Jesus is the second Adam. He is our federal representative, not like Adam who failed, the first Adam who failed, but our second Adam succeeded and has won for us that union with him and a new status, a new humanity, new life in him. And there is no union with Christ without crucifixion and death. Paul says that if we have been united with him, look at the text again, in a death like his, that is, his death is emblematic of our death in him, he then says, then we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Do you see the implication? The event that took place 2,000 years ago, the empty tomb, has everything to do with us today. Jesus was raised and we united to him in faith will be raised as well. We died with Christ, we will be raised with Christ. So then Jesus' victory over death is a victory in which we share because we are united with him in faith. What a comfort. What a comfort this is when we face the sting of death. Because of our connection to Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose from death, we can be confident that death will one day have no mastery over us. Hold on to that encouragement the next time death confronts you. So verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe, we believe that we will also live with him. Verse 5, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. These two verses, verses 8 and 5, present a picture of our union with Christ. And notice the language, we believe and we shall certainly. This is not a secondary truth, but a primary truth. Uh, our union with Christ extends from eternity to eternity. The roots of union with Christ are in divine election, eternity past. The basis of our union with Christ is his redemptive work in time, and the actual union with Christ is established with his God's people as we believe in him by faith. We shall be raised with Christ and glorified with him eternity future. That is what the gospel hope of Jesus' resurrection brings to us. And then, as I mentioned, the last point we'll spend a little bit more time on, and it is truth point number five. Point number five. Truth number five. Christ lives so that we might die to sin and walk in newness of life. And Paul covers this in verses 1 to 3, a part of verse 4, verses 6 to 7, and 11. But let's begin in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 gives us the answer dramatically and emphatically. By no means. You know, Paul preached hard about the freeness of God's grace. He emphasized it because so many people he preached to had a legalistic view of salvation and works righteousness. So he preached about God's free grace. So what they heard is that God loves to forgive. So why not give him more to forgive? After all, if forgiveness is guaranteed, we can sin as much 
as we like. Well, that's just absolutely wrong. It's defective thinking. And Paul says in verse 2, that is unthinkable. By no means. Some tra translations say, God forbid that kind of thinking. Grace abounding to you in the gospel means this, sin decreasing, not increasing. How could anybody be so casual about sin? And yet is, that is the deception of the human heart. The seriousness of sin fills this text. You cannot separate our justification and our holiness. You cannot separate our salvation and godliness. Paul says, by no means shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound. Shall we continue in our sin so grace may abound? By no means. And then take a look at verse 2. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? This is an absolutely core question. How shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? Well, living in it corresponds back with question uh, verse 1. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? How can we keep on living in sin? The idea in these two phrases, continue in verse 1 and live in verse 2, is that when we have become united with Christ in his death, we cannot go on with an unchanged pattern of sin in our lives. Something changed. Something has to be different. Notice that what Paul denies is not that you can never commit a sin. Hear that carefully. Paul does not say we suddenly become sinless, but you cannot live in it. Paul says, think about it for a minute. Think about who you are. If you will think about who you are in Jesus Christ, you will answer the question, and you will answer it, with an emphatic no. Of course we shouldn't go on sinning that grace may abound because of who I am in Christ. How shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? Paul is telling us that continuing in sin, living in sin, is a contradiction of who we are. Our identity, our new identity, in the second Adam. When a person dies, the former relationships are changed permanently. We know that in life. When we lose a loved one or a friend, that relationship is forever changed by death. It cannot continue the way it once was. How much more spiritually with sin? We cannot have the same relationship with sin that we once had. So the question, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? There is a no answer to this how question. We can't live in sin if we died to it. And again, Paul is not saying that we will be sinless or that somehow we ought to crucify ourselves or die, but rather that we have died because of our union with Christ. He's telling us a truth, something that is already true, not something we do, but something that's already true, something that happened to us when we believed on the Lord Jesus. That's verses one and two of point five. Then we move on to verse three and four. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. So Paul mentions here baptism by way of identification, not by mode, uh, not by when, how, where, when, those kind of questions about our baptism, our physical baptism. He's talking about 
our spiritual baptism. Paul mentions baptism by way of identification. Death and burial, joining is in view, united to Christ by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Think about your baptism. Your baptism symbolized what union with Christ actually brings about. You must identify your new life in Christ with a breaking of your old life. Remember the theme of, of Romans 6, death to sin, dead to sin, and the breaking of the dominion of sin and the power of sin. No longer is sin master over you. Christ is your master. No longer is sin your Lord. Christ is your Lord. And that is all symbolized in baptism. You died to your old life and are raised in union with Christ to newness of life. You're baptized into Christ, into his person. You're bound with him. You're in covenant with him. You're united with him. You're a beneficiary of his work. You're baptized into his death and you are raised to new life. So, you should be so closely identified with Christ in your new life as his disciple, your baptism should remind you of who and whose you are. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's speaking of our union with Christ in faith. And Paul wants you to know in verses 3, verses 6, and verse 9, he uses the word know. Paul wants you to know, do you know Jesus as your resurrected Savior? Because if you do, that means everything for your life now. Then notice Christ lives so that we might die to sin and walk in newness to life. Verse 4, Christ lives so that we might die to sin and walk in newness of life. That's part of our fifth truth point. Verse 4 continues, Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Our death to sin was so that we might walk in newness of life. When you believe on Jesus Christ, God grants you new life that flows from the resurrection of Christ. It's yours new life because you're united to him in faith. Now, again, is Paul saying you'll never sin again? No. Does it mean you'll never have a desire to sin? No, but what it does mean is that you are no longer under the dominion, the reign of sin. Newness of life means just that, not the same old way of life. The empty tomb of Easter morning, because of the resurrection of Christ, gives us power to live the Christian life, not to be sinless. Listen to that very carefully not to be sinless, but to sin less. And not by our own abilities and self-effort, but by the power of the Spirit. In Romans 8, 11, we are told, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, did you hear that? If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. It is an absolute lie of Satan to believe you are still under the dominion of sin and spiritual death. You are not. In fact, verse 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Our old self, notice what it says, our old self, what does that mean? Some translations have our old man. What Paul means by our old self is our entire lives lived in the world, beginning with our union with the first Adam, 
our sinful nature, our sinful old self, that connection with Adam that all of us were born with, that old self, that old sin nature. And Paul says that that's the thing that's been put to death. You're no longer. We, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. God has taken us out of Adam and has joined us to Jesus Christ, the second Adam. And we are no longer subject to the reign and the dominion and the rule of sin and death, but we've tr been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's Son. Verse 6 goes on to say, In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The empty tomb on Easter morning has everything to do with our Christian life today, that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Paul finishes and draws a whole conclusion. For or therefore, one who has died has been set free from sin, no longer slaves. This is what we call the gospel indicative. It's an absolute fact. It's just a fact of the resurrection. It's a truth. Here, the effect of being crucified with Christ is that we are not slaves to sin. The dominance of sin is broken. Do you not sense in your life, having come to know the Lord Jesus, a decisive break in your relationship with sin and how you relate to the way it used to be? Holy Spirit is in you. How, why live like your old self anymore? You're not a slave anymore. You're a son, you're a daughter of the risen king. Listen no longer to the dominion of the world, the flesh and the devil that tempts you to sin. In Romans 8.11, again, it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. We know, Romans 6.6, 6, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. That sounds exactly like Paul saying, you are a new creature, a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature. God has created you as a new creature in union with Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are new. The old has passed away and the new has come. You know, Paul is telling you something that is an absolute truth that has already been done for you. You need to pause and reflect on that. A disciple of Jesus should no more want to think about going back to their old life than adult to childhood, a married man to bachelorhood, and the prisoner who's been set free back to the jail cell. You are no longer who you once were in union with Christ. The old is crucified. The new has come. And notice the pairing of dead and alive in verses 10 and 11. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also most, must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's this cadence in these two last verses, verses 10 and 11. What was dead and what is now alive. We've heard this throughout our text. What is dead and what is now alive. Verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life Jesus lives, he lives to God. This perfect, completed, acceptable sacrifice of Jesus is illustrated throughout the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 7.26, it says that, For it was indeed fitting 
that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like others, the other high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the people. And then it says, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. That's exactly what verse 10 says. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. That same thing we read in, in Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. Jesus entered once for all into the holy place to offer himself his own blood. In Hebrews 9, 26 to 28, Jesus appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus offered his body once for all. And then it ends with, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. Verse 12 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, he sat down. It is finished. Nothing can be added. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. You know, verse 11, it was hard for me to believe, is the first command in the book of Romans. All the way into chapter 6, verse 11 of chapter 6 is the first command or imperative in the book of Romans. I could hardly believe that myself. And what an important verse it is. Verse 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's interesting, this first imperative or command, it literally doesn't ask us to do anything except believe what's already been said. You are to believe that you are, in fact, dead to sin. The Holy Spirit's initial and primary method of helping us fight sin and live as servants of God, it doesn't start with a command to live right. It's not a command to hop off our couch and get to work. It's a command to what? What does verse 11 say? Consider. We might say it another way, reckon, or recall, or remember, or realize. What? To see ourselves as who we are now in Christ. It says, dead to sin, yet alive in union with Christ. It's a command to remember and then to believe what we've remembered as we face day to day temptation to sin. Remember, consider, realize you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And Paul uses this language 19 times 19 times in his letters, he asks us to think, to recall, to remember, to reckon our new status, our new identity in Christ. And as we move to conclusion, let me just remind you what Paul's telling us. This is preventative theology, not corrective theology. Right now, this Easter morning, I want you to reflect, to think, to reckon, to consider and do it now and do it regularly. Keep on, as Paul says, counting yourself dead to sin on the one hand, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. With an ounce of prevention, Paul is seeking to counter our defective thinking. Why do we live in the after mode, in the cleanup of sin, after we sin? Why can't we now remember, recall, and think before we sin? Let it be preventative, not corrective. And say to ourselves, before we're tempted to sin, this is not who I am in Christ. Dead to sin means you must think of yourself as dead to the pervasive love and ruling power of sin in your life. So, one last question based on verse 11. Do you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus? Union with Christ is what we've been talking about. The very central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation 
not only in its application, but its once-for-all accomplishment in the finished work of Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the source of our justification, and it's the source of our sanctification. The empty tomb has everything to do with how we live today. Dead to sin, alive to Christ. Jesus' resurrection for the believer is a fountain of new life. And what Romans 6 is teaching us is that the empty tomb of Easter morning is the very source of our transformation, our sanctification. Not only are we accepted as righteous in our justification, but we're being transformed increasingly into righteousness by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember the two questions we started with? Verse 1 and 2. Will you go on sinning so that grace may increase? And how can people who have died to sin live in it? Well, you can't. If Jesus really is the resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus lives and he is calling you to be dead to sin and alive to God in him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are so grateful for a gospel that teaches us that we are united in faith to Christ and made alive. Help us to be believers and to be doers of your word. Help us to die to sin this week daily. Help us to live to righteousness. Help us to die to sin and live alive to God in Christ Jesus. And Father, if we're discouraged, give us hope. And may the reality of Jesus' resurrection inform our everyday lives, beginning now and continuing for the rest of our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, greetings, friends. I hope you enjoyed the message you just heard, the hopeful message of Easter morning and the empty tomb and what it means for us today. And we also would love to invite you any Sunday to join us for worship at Faith Presbyterian Church of Merritt Island. If you want to hear more messages just like this, join us on our YouTube channel, and I'll see you again.